Hello, everyone, and welcome to our fifth edition of The Call With Us. Um, we have Marco today with us from Intergen GmbH, and he'll be running to how, into a journey of how to set up your own Cosmos validator. Uh, he has experience in this field as he has been running his own validator for a while, and he'll be sharing with you um, what it is the best setup to do that. Um, this is a session which will last uh, almost two hours um, that is being recorded. So everyone who would like to watch the replay, you can find it on our Cosmos YouTube channel and also on the cosmos.network co with us uh, webpage. Um, this being said, um, if you have questions, um, please send them here to me in the chat privately or also in the Discord call with us uh, now that we have. Um, and um, next workshop is on the 21st of uh, July and we'll be going through uh, building on uh, Ethermint. So check out the new workshop that we have listed. You'll find them there. So uh, we're good to go now. So thank you, Marco, for joining us and for sharing your experience and running the Cosmos Validator with us. Thanks for having me. Um, okay, yeah, so today we'll be walking through on how to run a validator, the recommended setup with Tendermint. And so the agenda is kind of we'll cover what is a validator, what does it do, and what is its role in a, in a proof of stake network the Sentry architecture and what it does and what it enables, this a server configuration, and then we'll start up uh, a server from scratch and we'll set up a Sentry node and a validator node. And then we'll walk through a simple couple steps to um, secure your server. Um, there's many ways in how to do this. And then last set up metrics through to Prometheus server. Um, hopefully we won't last the entire two hours, but doing stuff live is always interesting. So what is a validator? Um, so a validator helps secure a proof of stake network. It, had, it participates in consensus in that it proposes blocks and it votes on proposed blocks from other validators. A validator in a proof of stake network has something at stake. That's kind of the stake and proof of stake. It has something that it's willing to lose if it acts maliciously. And this is kind of the hardest part to protect against. There is countless attacks that can be done, but um, in the case of the Cosmos Hub, they, we use a variant of proof of stake called delegated proof of stake, in which a user, um, anyone in the network, you, me, um, instead of having their own in this um, in, in participation of the security of the network we can delegate our tokens to a validator who will um, securely participate in consensus. And then from that, there's a block reward because um, proof of stake networks are inherently inflationary. And there's a transaction fee, of course, associated with every transaction that the proposer and the validators that voted on the block will receive. And these, these rewards and transaction fees will trickle down to you as a delegator to this validator. In the Cosmos Hub, um, there's many different uh, sources and different cases of getting the full reward. The Cosmos Hub actually rewards validators for waiting the entire, uh, waiting for 100% of the validator signatures. This is, of course, um, if a validator is down for some reason, block, and, um, then the validator won't be able to receive their um, participation rewards in the block. Uh, now, a validator can also be run as a full node, but also as a signing node. What a signing node is essentially um, is a node that only has the most current state and it only and it drops the previous state. So, or um, that's one case. And another case would be that it only receives the votes that it needs to sign. It doesn't actually keep any state, so it's a very light and efficient. Um, there's multiple examples of this, but it is not built into protocol currently. Um, of course, if you have any questions, just ping Adriana and um, please ask away. 
So in a century node architecture, we have essentially uh, we have a couple nodes that are communicating with the public network. The validator is private in percent of these. And this is primarily due to DDoS um, protection, because in this case, a, if someone's trying to attack the validator, they would first have to break through the sentry, and sentries are protecting the validator's IP and node ID, and so they will not be able to find out what is the IP of the validator to try and attack it. Um, now, this the photo that you see here is kind of one example. Uh, a different example of a sentry node architecture could be a single connection to the validator instead of um, three connections to three centuries. Now, um, this three is kind of a recommendation that we do, but of course, you're kind of free to do as, as different configurations as you see fit. Um, what I have seen when I was running a validator was that um, many people would run one seed node, and a seed node is essentially a node that only um, only feeds other nodes, other addresses. And so essentially, if your sentry or C node were to go down and you needed, uh, so if your sentry or if your sentry node were to go down, then you would only need the seed node's IP because the seed node would have a list of peers that would, it would be able to feed your sentry to catch up and um, get back to where it was and protect your validator. Now, one of the main reasons why um, this DDoS mechanism um, it was thought of is kind of it was it was a security consideration due to the prediction of the next proposer. So currently in Tendermint and in many proof of stake protocols, um, the proposer of the next block is actually deterministic. Um, and so to protect the validator who is going to be the next block proposer, a firewall, essentially a firewall of other nodes, is needed. Um, there is a couple teams out there who are working on um, switching keys between centuries instead of having a validator. So there's just a kind of a server just feeding keys to different centuries depending on which one um, is the closest and the fastest. Um, and now this kind of century node architecture, it could go away if it was random leader election. So in random leader election, the leader is essentially non-deterministic. You cannot predict who will be the leader um, who will be the proposer of the next block. And so essentially the DDoS mechanism, um, the DDoS attack is more or less um, not possible. Okay, so um, Tendermint was built. Um, so Tendermint is the underlying technology that is running the Cosmos Hub and other Cosmos based blockchains. And it was built in the of low memory um, environments. And so we recommend that you run with at least two gigabytes. Um, there have been experiments of running uh, Tendermint on Raspberry Pis and running it successfully um, without any issues. And of course, um, I've, I've, the more RAM you put on the server, the quicker it'll be, the more processing throughput you'll be able to do. Um, and so in the in Tendermint and in the Cosmos Hub, of course, your state grows quite quickly. For every block, you um, even if it's an empty block with no transactions, there is some state there. And so at um, so it is recommended to put a large amount, a large hard drive, an SSD or a normal hard drive. And uh, to start up, 80 gigabytes, um, 60 gigabytes to 80 gigabytes is recommended. And of course, at, it, at some point, you will hit a full disk and you will have to migrate to a larger disk. Of course, when you're, right, when you're um, picking a server, um, any OS is possible. Um, different OSs have different um, security guarantees and just different environments for what the user would like to do. Um, you can run in cloud providers. You can run on your own hosted machine, on your own personal machines. Um, it's kind of up to you on how you want to set up your validator configuration and what you believe to be the most secure. So also if you are using a cloud provider um, like AWS and Google Cloud, many of them come um, with a way to preset firewalls um, in the dashboard. 
um, so AWS, you can preset this um, with security rules. And um, in that case, on the validator itself, you wouldn't actually have to need to configure a firewall, um, but a Nginx uh, balancer is always recommended, especially for the RPC connection. So of course, when you're starting a server, so in our example today, we'll walk through setting up Gaia. Um, there's already one node running, like I touched on earlier. And we'll be connecting to this node. And so we'll be running the same software that's being run in the Cosmos Hub currently. So the requirements for starting a server are um, you need Golang 1.12 or greater. And of course, you need Make, because Make is the build tool that we used um, for configuration. GCC, this is used for um, the Ledger technology. Um, like Ledger Nano, and so you'll be able to interact with your node and with um, Git, of course, the, a clone of the Gaia repo. And then when we, when we solve, um, when we get through all, that entire list, and of course you need a Genesis file before you start. When you start a new node, you always need to get the original Genesis file. There's no way to start without it. And a quick way to get this is um, if there's an existing RPC port um, available, um, that people have provided to the public, you can just go to their slash Genesis page and then uh, route, and then in there you'll be able to find the entire Genesis.json. So there's a, there's a lot less questions than I thought there would be, so we might get through this a bit faster. Um, okay, so um, for our Sentry node, it's kind of the front end to our entire network. So where we want it to handle peer exchange because we want the address book within the Sentry to be um, quite large. So it can act fast and send messages quite quickly that it receives from the validator. Persistent peers, um, this is the peer that the, we want the Sentry node to always be connected to. And so in many cases, um, this will be your validator or other Sentry nodes. The nice thing about this is that you can set your, uh, your other Sentry nodes to communicate through a virtual private um, a VPC, a virtual private network, um, on your cloud provider. So in many cases, AWS provides a private IP to communicate between servers, and you'll be able to use this to communicate between Sentries, but also to communicate with your validator. The private peer IDs is, consists of the peer IDs which are meant to stay private. So this will be your validator primarily. Um, in some cases, some people run multiple validators and this is for failover protection. But um, in our case, we'll just be running with one validator with a century in front of it to um, display how it's And um, we want the address book uh, settings to not be strict. This is primarily, so it can be, of course, not strict, but then um, it can provide different IPs. Um, so uh, we can play around with it a bit more. So I'll kind of walk through the slides and then we'll go through the server and start playing, uh, playing around with that side of things. So the validator node is our backend. Um, it is the node that does the handling of the logic. It um, verifies the commits, it, it signs um, transactions, I'm sorry, assigns votes, assigns proposals, and this is what secures the network. So we want this to be especially safe. For our validator node, we don't want the peer exchange module of Tendermint to be enabled. This is because we don't want it to be its IP to other nodes, and we don't want um, it to be able to try and search for other nodes because we only wanted to communicate our Sentry nodes. Marco, then, yes? can we help just one second? Uh, I would like you to, if you can close the camera, maybe sucking out of the bandwidth for the sound and just leave the slides. Okay, perfect. let's see if, if this is better now. Thank you. So, okay, perfect. Should I repeat anything? Okay, all good. Um, and of course, we want to mimic what we did in the Sentry node of setting the address book um, set to false. 
uh, the strictness of the address book. Now, um, this is kind of where it gets kind of interesting. Um, of course, in a follow-up session, we'll be walking through setting up BKMS. This is essentially our key management system. We will remove the private key from the validator node because um, in our example, um, the validator key will be saved on the server and provided for quick access to the validator. But this is not the most secure as people could um, break into your server. So, yeah, securing your server from DOS attacks is key. And so this is kind of the most important thing because if you're running a Sentry node or if you're running a validator, you want to protect from outside um, communication other than what you expect. In the validator's case, we only want to communicate with a Sentry node and possibly a key management or an HSM system. For our Sentry, um, many people and in many cases, we uh, reduce the C connection to only be available to a specific IP so we can only communicate with certain people because the RPC has been known to provide a mechanism for people to slow down nodes. And if our people are able to slow down your sentry nodes, then it slows down the communication to your validator. Of course, for this, a Nginx proxy can be used, a load balancer, and of course, um, a simple firewall. And we'll walk through setting up a simple firewall using UFW. So now, let me, let me switch to a different. Okay. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Yeah. I'm going to take that as a yes. Because have... I, keep, I keep forgetting that no one can hear me. Okay, we have a question from Anjana, who I think is new to the Cosmos phase. She's asking what the difference is between Cosmos, I believe Cosmos SDK and Tendermint are. So uh, I want to make sure that everyone understands that, that Tendermint is the consensus engine while Cosmos SDK is the framework for building applications. Um, yes. And yeah, and if everyone has more uh, questions about this, I can send, um, I can send like a presentation in the chat here. Yeah, kind of a, a short description could be like a, um, there's many, many different acronyms that people use, but um, what uh, I kind of stick to is kind of your framework is kind of like your front end, the application, the, the stuff that the clients and users interact with. But Tendermint is like your back end where all the heavy lifting of the logic is handled. So the front end could be something like React and the back end could be something like Node. Um, Tendermint does the heavy lifting and the communication between peers and handling of consensus, while the Cosmos SDK handles what you want to do. Do you want to uh, make a governance proposal? Do you want to submit a transaction for, um, for sending tokens to a, to a friend and all those types of things? We also have um, a question here uh, from Tosh. He says, um, what is your opinion on a sentry relayer connection? I think this is like a private network or a validator setup instead of a sentry. So I have just copy pasted his entire questions and question in the chat. He said he, ha he has like mixed feelings towards the relayer nodes, but would like to hear your opinion or experience on that. Like why are validators using this architecture? And you have the full question in the chat. Let me just double check on the form. I don't recall the relay node. And also, while you look for this, Clint is asking if each sentry node needs to run on separate hardware or not. Um, for this, 
I think he, he asks if the sentry nodes attached to the validator need to run on separate hardware. Yes, yes, I, I was just thinking about the relay nodes. So in my experience, um, the only two types of nodes I've kind of interacted with for validators is the sentry architecture. So you had a full node up front and a signing node in the back. Um, and I've also experienced with uh, failover protection um, kind of signing HSMs. In the, in the case that you have, let's say, four sentry nodes and you don't have actually a validator node, and your HSM will choose at random one sentry node to send its key to, and that key will sign on that, um, on that sentry. So that was kind of the most interesting thing that I've run across and played around with, but um, I haven't looked into a relayer node. Um, and then to the next question, uh, does, an e does each sentry node need to run on separate hardware? Yes, um, so it is recommended to run on different hardware. Um, it, to run all on the same hardware is um, kind of putting all your eggs in one basket. If that server has maintenance or is down um, for any number of reasons, then the entire Sentry node um, architecture will be down and your validator will be able to communicate to the outside world. So I think it's important for people to understand the sentry nodes are like a backup also for the validators. So it's very important to have them in separate locations in case something happens to um, like one of those or, or the validator you have like backup running securely somewhere else. Um, if you put them all together on the same hardware, if something happens, then you uh, run into the risk of uh, your validator completely shutting down or not uh, responding anymore. Um, so I just got a question from Leo asking, can the validator nodes share the same set of sentry nodes? So if you're running multiple validators, um, you do have to be very careful for not double signing. Um, and this is something that uh, is pretty scary because if you do double sign, then you're essentially will get slashed, um, but your validator nodes can share the same set of sentry nodes. There's multiple different types of kind of um, mistakes that people can make. Um, there's only, I believe, currently been one example of someone double um, signing a block, double proposing a block, um, in which they were syncing a new validator and using the same network as the other net, as the running validator and the participating validator. And he forgot to set, um, the validator to not, not sign blocks and not propose blocks. And so while he was thinking, his node actually proposed a block that was in the past. And so when the network recognized this, they essentially um, blocked his um, validator key. And so he could not use that validator key ever again. And I believe a certain percentage of his entire stake was burned and the rest um, was returned to its delegates. Okay, so okay, now, no oh. questions for now. Okay, we're good. Perfect. Okay, so now I'm just going to sh into a server. Okay, so of course there's no go. So in the first steps, um, of course, we want to upgrade the server and update any dependencies it has. And so to do this, we just run sudo app get update. I'm, I usually, um, for these examples, it's for me, it's the quickest to run on an Ubuntu server and I'm using DigitalOcean, um, but any cloud provider can be used. We can also get started on a different server. 
Okay, so if you can walk us through what you are doing now. Yeah, um, so the top server is just currently updating um, its dependencies um, and um, anything that's out of date um, to just keep servers dependencies up to date. Um, there has been no attacks to servers because um, like at the Equa facts I hack, I believe, and many attacks, hacks out there in the world primarily stem because they did not upgrade their dependencies. So this server has been updated. So we'll do the same thing Oops. down here. So this is just running the same thing as above, as we just ran above. And now we need to, of course, install Go. Um, for this example, I'll just be using Go, I believe, is the latest um, one point and you, otherwise if you do it through the to installer um, you can get a old version um, i'm not actually sure what the version is actually through app kit right now um, since every time i do install go i use wgit so now since it's installed um, okay so we have it, connected to the server and now we're installing go yeah, and so we just pulled down a tar file, and so now we'll be um, kind of untarring. Um, I don't know if that's actually a word. Um, the file into a set of files that will be the Go source code. And so here you can see here's a tar file that we downloaded, and then when we ran the last command, we got the Go, and we want to. That go to our user local. And then when we, of course, when you download the go, we need to export environment and variables. And so now we'll be able to use go. Um, Go is the language that's used by Tendermint and the Cosmos SDK. So since the top one's going a bit faster, I'll just go along with that. Uh, let me just grab the clone URL for Gaia. So now we're cloning Gaia. Gaia is the software that runs on the Cosmos Hub. And recently, recently we migrated from master to master to main. And so if we double check, yep, we are on main. Um, and so right now, the next couple steps is to install make. Um, so make is of course the what we use for to providing commands for users to install software and to run tests, linting, um, a whole plethora of things. And then the next thing we need to install is GCC. This is used by Ledger. So you'll be able to interact with nodes um, with the software using a ledger device. And I'll be doing the same stuff we have run through in the below server. So does anyone, um, is everyone, anyone able to follow along 
or is anyone also trying to set up their own node, um, you can do it on your laptop, on your computer, or if you are able to SH it to a server, um, then we can kind of play around and get you connected to the testnet as well. Jump in with your questions if you have some. So now back in the top um, server, we'll be installing the Gaia software. And this installs two binaries. One is Gaia D and, and the other is Gaia CLI. They both do two different things. Gaia D is the daemon that runs the software. So you can call Gaia D start to run the software. And Gaia CLI is how you interact with the chain. So this will handle your transactions, your queries, um, and transactions of modules. Stoyan is saying that uh, they are using Docker for this. Yeah, Do Docker is a, another way to do this. Um, I, I'm a huge fan of Docker in development environments. Um, I'm not the biggest fan in production environments. Um, of course, everyone has their own opinions. Um, but at least for me, I've run into some weird networking issues when using Docker the best um, for production environments. So now the software is installed on the top server. And so now we'll be able to um, run Gaia D and then we'll be able to see the software. And then um, this, these are the kind of commands we will be able to run um, with Gaia D. And of course, with Gaia CLI, you have a status, um, configurable parameters, and the query subcommands and the transaction subcommands. Um, so before we start, um, the way I go through this process is actually before I start configuring the Genesis and, and in the Genesis and start making my node, I actually go into my guide D config. Oh, whoops. This is called And then we'll go into Gaia D, into the config folder. Um, this will house the genesis, the prior validator key, and configurable parameters for Tendermint and also the SDK. For right now, we'll just be touching the configurable parameters of Tendermint. So the first thing we want to do is um, change our Prometheus flag from false to true. And this will enable us closure. We lost you a bit here. Go back to changing the. Can, can you hear me? Yeah. OK. Perfect. Um, yes. So right now, I'm just changing the Prometheus flag from false to true. And this will um, automatically, on when the node starts, expose it, the port to 6660 for Prometheus to pick up and uh, for Prometheus server to pick up and collect metrics from. Um, the exciting thing about this, oh, actually, um, the exciting thing about the Prometheus metrics um, that is coming in the upcoming release, um, if you are um, a user of the Cosmos SDK or um, a node operator, the next release will house metrics from the SDK directly. So modules, um, you'll be able to get more what's happening in the application. So here, here's the RPC port. So the RPC port is exposed over 26657. Um, and by default, Tendermint sets it to the local host IP. And so for in our case, we wanted to we want to expose it to the wider internet. So we'll be able to query it from anywhere in the world. And then that's the main things we want to change for now. We'll come back to it. Um, Leo's asking 
should index um, should index all tags or keys be set to true for a validator is entirely up to you um, as a node operator. Um, at least for me, um, in, in this example, um, it's, I'm going to leave it as true. But um, as in the past when I was running a validator, I would turn off the indexer and turn off as much as I could, just so I can have the run the, have the node running more efficient. Um, in the future, um, this is another thing that is changing. Um, in the future, this will kind of be a default or um, depending on the application on how they handle it because ten these flags will not be able to be set in Tendermint. So now we have created, um, we have set up our node. Um, we want to, next thing we want to do is grab the genesis that was already created when I created the network. So I'm just going to So in the Genesis file, you have all your parameters um, and then of Tendermint and of each module. And this is kind of what sets up your application. Um, what is the most recent knowledge of your application? So in the case of the Cosmos Hub, um, if it were to do an upgrade, it would actually export the current state of everything into a Genesis file. That Genesis file will be quite large because it has everyone's accounts, everyone's delegations, and everything like this. And then on the new chain, um, or on the um, network upgrade, they would use that Genesis as the beginning part, the beginning block. So let me just need to find the node I was using earlier. Yeah. So what I'm doing right now that you can't see because of the sharing screen stuff is actually I'm going to be uh, slash genesis of the other node. And um, once it loads, I am going to grab the genesis and then put it in our genesis JSON. And then we'll be able to start the node. Up. Um, Asku is asking, uh, he didn't uh, quite understand where the Genesis file was located. If you can explain again. Yes. Um, so the Genesis file in many Uh, so the Genesis file in many cases, um, I'll show again. Um, so when you create a node, you essentially have to create a Genesis file. And that's what this kind of output right here is. Um, as you can see here, it's kind of like the goal bonded amount, the previous proposer, the validators accumulated commissions. And so this is the Genesis. And so, but the thing is when we want to join an existing network, we have to actually go grab that Genesis, um, that network's Genesis, because this Genesis won't actually work for that one. And so what I did uh, that is went to a RPC and that um, actually, So I can actually curl it from here and show you kind of the output that would be received. So, okay. This is a different um, node that has already been running. And so we would go to this RPC endpoint 
can type in slash Genesis, and then it would output the Genesis file. And so essentially this to one of, I believe, one, two, one, two. So it would be here to here. And then we would go back to our local Genesis file and just output it here. Now, oops. Let's hope that would be correct. Usually grabbing stuff without double checking like this can cause a bit of an issue. Um, getting the brackets wrong. Um, of course, it is J JSON. Um, and so now, since we have the gen uh, JSON, the Genesis file, and we've configured our node, we're missing one last final step. And that last final step would be to connect to an existing node. So to do Okay. Asko, did, did, did this answer your question about the genesis? Thank you. Yes, he said. Perfect. Um, yeah, so to add a node to our, um, to connect, for us to connect to, we have to go back to config.toml file, and then we can search for persistent peers. And in here, we're going to be out. Uh, we're going to be inputting the node ID of um, of the node that's already running, the IP, and the port that it's exposing for P2P um, communication. Um, now, in the next step, um, we want. So now, um, some people. The one question that I've run into and kind of the issue that I ran into when I was first seeing to play around with Cosmos nodes is how to get the node ID. And I do believe this has come up. Um, some people will have run into this question. And the simplest place, the quickest place would be for to go to the tendermint command of Gaia D and go show node ID. And this is your nodes ID. It's a hash of, I believe, the moniker um, and some other information. And so this is um, what your peer, what your node will be as identified as. So now, since we got, um, since we inputted the needed information, now let's actually quickly see. This is going to be first try. If we lost you again. There's a chance I got the brackets wrong on Genesis. Um, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, perfect. What you have said before? I was just saying, if we get this right, the copying the JSON from here, because I think I copied one extra bracket. Um, but let's see if I was able to get it right. Yeah, I got I got the wrong I got the wrong number of brackets. One, the bottom should have one, two, four. So, doing stuff live is always fun. Oh, there we go, should have four. Okay, let's see if it's able to find the other okay and now as you can see um, the other node has been running for a couple hours and so right now it is catching up to the most recent height of the other node and so and and i believe it's already caught up um so this is one example of syncing a node um in the future um there'll be different and quicker ways um this is um, kind of an issue for some people in syncing large um, chains. And so we'll be using this node as a century node. And then we'll 
and try to use this node that I'm um, hitting enter on, this terminal, as a validator node. So let's see what if we had it installed. No. Now we're going to run through the previous commands of the other, uh, the stuff we did on the other node. And so first we need to install the guide D software. And in many scenarios, you'd run um, the node in the background. Um, for this, I'm leaving it open right now, just because we will have to stop the node um, when we want to configure it um, to run uh, as a sentry node and to configure it as um, uh, when this validator is able to connect to it. OK, so now it's like catching up. So the, the top node has already actually caught up. Um, and now it's actually participating, um, receiving blocks that the other node has proposed and finalized. Since, since that node is the only node in the network, then, um, then there's, uh, it's, not, it's only receiving information that has already been finalized. Mm -hmm. uh, OK. Where were we? Gaia D init. Let's say the other one was tacos. Let's call this one Tuesdays. <laughs> um, and so now we're going to go to into our config.toml. Again, like we did in the previous one. and configure it to how uh, we want a validator to be configured. So um, as I said earlier, um, for validator node, we want the peer exchange to be set to false. So X. So this is the peer exchange reactor. So in, in our example, we want this to be false. But if let's say you're running um, a normal node, you'd want this to be true. Or if you're running a seed node, um, you'd want this to be true. And then for a seed node, you'd actually want other configurations set to zero, something like the mempool size. So you wouldn't actually be processing and receiving and sending transactions. You would just be feeding other nodes information about other peers. So we set that to false. Now, oh. I actually forgot to grab forgot to grab the ID of this node and go back. And it's already caught up. So in this, on this uh, node, we'll go back to the persistent peers. Here, we'll be inputting this node's um, ID. And let me just grab its IP. The 2665, I always get mixed up on it. Um, and then, of course, we want to set our Prometheus to true. And now, this is not required for. Um, 
for a node operator. I do it just so I can uh, ping the servers um, from my laptop or from a um, orchestration uh, mechanism. So in many cases, um, for Docker, Kubernetes, and in these cases, uh, you could use the RPC to check the health of a node. Um, and, and people use in this case, or if you're just using something like Ansible, you could uh, set up a script to ping it to just make So now that we've configured the node to, so now that we've configured the node to how we want it to be. Now, just like in the past node, we need to fetch the genesis. So curl. Genesis. So it has to be four. While you are copying this, I want to make sure that uh, if we have questions or not, I don't know if this is too high tech for people who are watching us and if they want more information or more details on the commands that you're using or uh, the steps that you are taking. So please feel free to send us the questions you have. Don't, don't be shy. Don't yeah, be there, are no stupid, there are no stupid questions. I want to make sure people understand the steps to uh, opening up the validator. And mm -hmm. I want to make sure that even people who haven't uh, tried this on before uh, understand like what is happening here and they'll be able to do that on their own also after watching this tutorial. So stop us anytime you have questions, no matter how, um, um, how they are and we'll, we'll make sure to answer them. Yes, please, please ask as many questions as you can. Um, the interesting part is going to happen pretty soon when we have to interact. We have to go back to the server that's already running and send tokens to this node so we can actually create a validator. So, okay, can you make us um, a summary of what you have done so far in just a few words, Marco? Yes. So currently, um, what we've done so far is uh, we walked the different uh, node architectures, a century node architecture, the different nodes uh, available in this type of architecture. Um, kind of some a quick glimpse into how to um, work. And we walked through setting up a node from scratch with um, Gaia. And now we are uh, with that went from copying the genesis from an existing node, connecting to an existing node, and exposing Prometheus and exposing the RPC port to the World Wide Web. And now we're doing the same thing on our second node. And this node has been configured to be run as a validator, meaning it will not participate in peer exchange, and it will not be, um, its IP and node ID will not be broadcast to the entire network. This is going to be interesting again. I'm able to get it right. Okay. So now now okay. before we want before we start this node, um, something that we have to do is um, we have to go back to our century node that the node that we'll be using as a century and add it as a persistent peer because we do not want this Sentry node to broadcast um, our validator's IP to the broader network, but we want to use the Sentry node um, to catch up to the network. So to do that, we'll be getting the ID of the node um, as I shared before.
Okay, so in easy terms, you are hiding the IP away from uh, being broadcasted. Yes. So right now, um, I'm going to go back into the config. Uh, tumble. Solomon is asking if since the audio kind of breaks up, breaks up from time to time. Sorry, Solomon. We're, we're doing our best. <laughs> Sometimes the internet is not uh, our best friend. Uh, if you can find like a step-by-step -step guide or document somewhere. Yes, there, there are multiple. Um, so there is, let me grab you one. Um, I just have to remember we have too many docs sites. Okay, we'll search for it, Solomon, and so, we'll share it with you here yeah. in the chat and also in the Discord channel. So, so, um, so I'm sending you kind of the um, uh, one from the hubs documentation. And you can send it to everyone. There is another. Okay, sorry. Boom. Okay, great. And then there's also um, a introduction to century architectures and um, a deeper dive into it um, at the docs um, from Tender. Um, so, so if, if I do cut out, I, I apologize. Um, please just ping um, and ask me to repeat. I'm happy to do so. Okay, so you have shared with us this um, um, uh, Vieta setup from uh, hub.cosmos.net network and also the one on the validators and uh, from docs. Um, can everyone see those? Um, Mariko has posted them uh, in the chat for everyone to see. And I'll also take this here and add it to the Discord channel for everyone to have them there in case they would like to browse through them. I also haven't checked the Discord in a bit. So. I'm scared, don't worry. I'm on top of it. Perfect. Um, okay, awesome. So where we where we left off is and now we're adding the validators node ID um, to the private peer ID list of the node that we will be using as our century node. So we did we came into file, um, this file is the config.toml. Um, this file contains lots of settings for tenements configuration. So. Okay, we have a question from Denny. Yeah. And he's asking, how does seed mode work? Can it be on while syncing? Um, so seed mode, is um, it, it can be on while syncing. Um, you'll essentially just try and start, try and crawl the network. Um, it's usually uh, usually run as a specific node type. So um, you wouldn't, I mean, you can run it as a full node, but um, it does set up a nicer configuration when you're able to run seed mode when you have stuff turned off. Um, okay, um, and so in this case, if we wanted to run a node as seed mode, then uh, the pref the recommended setup is actually to go to the mempool configuration options and set the number of transactions in the mempool to zero, and this way you're informally um, turning off the mempool. So you will not, your mempool will not be working essentially. It will be on, but not processing anything. Maybe it would be like a very good time here to explain a few words what the mempool is. Yeah, for sure. 
So the mempool is a pool of transactions that um, are submitted by users. And so you can think of it as when um, a bunch of people submit, those transactions are not executed immediately. There is, of course, a delay based on the block time. And so the transactions accrue in the mempool. And then when it comes time for a block, for a validator to propose a block, he looks at the mempool and says, what transactions should I take from the mempool? And then he picks them up from the mempool, adds, him, adds them into the block he's about to propose to the network, and then he proposes it to, and then once he does so, then he's able to propose it to the network. In many cases, mempools um, are a um, prior, priority um, ordered list. And so the gas fees that you set on a transaction will set its um, urgency. So if you were kind of seeing this in Ethereum, um, that many people, that the transaction fees are going up quite heavily. And so if you actually pay a lower gas fee, then you will, your transaction will take longer to execute because you're fighting a lot more people to get into a block. But if you pay a higher transaction fee, then you'll be bumped to the front of the list and your transaction is more likely to be picked up by the miners. Mm -hmm. And also, I think it is very important to highlight the fact that the mempool has to be clean from time to time. Yes, and so, um, of course, the mempool, um, in the current design of the mempool, um, not all transactions are picked up. Some can be lingering around for a longer period of time. And so, um, if other transactions are coming in front, or the, tr the application is calling one transaction above another transaction nonstop, then uh, the mempool can get filled up and a bit cluttered. And then that you're able to call via command to flush the mempool, essentially you're flushing the transactions and then it will start to fill up again with the messages that are sent from other nodes. Now there's many, um, yeah. this is a, excuse me. Yeah, sure. I, I said that I think we, uh, I hope we have answered uh, the question regarding this. Yes. Um, is, are there more questions? Not for now. Thank you. Perfect. Um, yeah, so a lot of the, a lot of the configuration will, I can kind of actually cover some of these configuration options, um, to better explain them. Uh, let's go. Where are we? Okay. So, um, you have configuration options for almost everything in Tendermint, um, which is probably the best um, thing, just because as we've seen on the Cosmos Hub, there are validators that will misuse these settings to propose blocks or to move forward on a block a lot faster than other people can communicate their votes. Um, now, this isn't really detrimental to anyone, um, except the person doing it because they are not getting the reward for actually waiting for everyone to submit their votes or waiting the full timeout. So let's start at the top. Okay, so here, here we have the proxy app. In Tendermint, um, the idea behind Tendermint is you can write your application in any language. Um, and so this is kind of where your app lives. It doesn't have to live kind of together. It can actually live on separate servers. Your monitor is of the node. And of course, if you want to fast sync. Um, now, of course, I don't really know a reason why you wouldn't want to fast sync. Um, but this is a configurable, op configurable option. To sync um, not in FastSync currently would mean that you, were, you would be syncing while participating in consensus, which is very slow. And so it is actually preferred to run with this on. Now, when running a node or even running an application, um, you may not want to use the default database 
So the default database is actually go level DB, but um, the code for the SDK and Tendermint is designed in a way that you can actually run with different databases. This won't affect um, the network. So individual nodes could run with uh, separate types of different types of databases. The supported types um, there are go level DB, C level DB, Bolt DB. Um, we recently added support for Badger DB, and the list is um, unfortunately growing. Um, but we hope to do database testing and provide a faster environment for everyone. So if you run into an issue, um, kind of the only times you'll have to worry about these two, the log level, and the log format, is when um, you run into an issue or you want to debug something that's going on with your node. Um, if you're running into an error, into um, some sort of weird error, or you just want to see more so what's going on in the node, um, how often it's throwing errors, how often it's um, doing un unor unorthodox things, then you would change the log level. Then the path to your Genesis file, and then these two are, are fairly important. So in your crypt validator key file, what this is, is um, the type of key that the network is using. So in many of these cases, um, uh, in 100% of the cases of ed25519, the address and the private key. Now this is a very important um, file to keep secure. And that is why key management systems and HSMs are recommended when running a validator. Now, what the state file is, is the last known state, the last known height that your validator, that your validator key signed at. Now, this is to help to try and help prevent double signatures. Um, because if you were to restart your node um, for any number of reasons, um, you want to have knowledge of, hey, I signed at this height. So while you're syncing, you should not try and sign or do anything until you get to this height. Um, and if you're caught up. So this we lost you. of your validator. Okay, we lost you. About I don't know, 20 so seconds. So here in the um, the pre validator L L A. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. We'll go I'm, back. I'm back now, right? Okay, perfect. Um, so if um, yeah, so if you would um, point the port and the IP, if it's a TCP or if it's a TCP um, IP or Unix socket, then you would provide the Unix socket address. And this tells the Tendermint node that, hey, you should not use the priv validator key JSON, um, but you should use an external signing um, device to sign um, the votes and proposals that come to you. And then this is kind of more information about um, the app and if you're running over socket. And so the ABCI is of course run over socket in our case. Um, the profiler uh, port is um, in Golang. There's the notion of profiling an application and this will show you where an application spends the most amount of time, most amount of um, bandwidth, most amount of uh, memory usage. And so this is useful again mostly for development purposes to help us debug how we can speed up tenement to provide a faster environment for users. I'm gonna go through a bit go through some a bit faster um, just because this file is um, a hundred or so lines. So here we have the RPC connection, the RPC server configuration options. Um, in the beginning you saw that we changed the LA LADDR from 127.0.0.1 to um, 0.0.0.0. 0 
to allow um, external um, devices to query the RPC port. Now, when doing so, it is recommended to have an Nginx configuration in front, primarily because this can cause your node to slow down if it's being hit too often. Um, and then on that, we have all the core configurations. You have the gRPC um, address. Um, gRPC is used, can be used for submitting transactions. And then, um, of course, this is kind of um, gets into the nitty gritty of the RPC. Can you hear me? Yeah, it's kind of um, breaking down from time to time. Okay. Um, uh, so this is getting to the nitty gritty. Um, this, these are many things that you as a node operator do not have to worry, but if you want to get into heavily customizing your node, um, you can. Um, you can diminish kind of the max open connections for your node, the uh, max uh, subscription clients, and the amount of subscriptions per client. This is kind of, these, these are all configurable options for RPC. And of course, you can provide a TLS cert, uh, certification, certificate, and a key so you can protect your um, RPC connection. Now on the P2P uh, configuration options, you have the port that the P2P communicates with, um, any seeds. And so you can put a seed node in here. So instead of you having to um, always connect to a peer, here is where you put your seed node in. Persistent peers, we already covered a bit. Um, UPnP port forwarding, um, this is for NAT. Um, Again, um, unless it's not something to worry about. Um, your address book, um, setting your address book to strict, um, the number of inbound outbound peers. Now, the, ma the max number of inbound outbound peers does limit the amount of, of course, does limit the amount of peers you have in your address book. Um, and this, uh, you can raise it to a larger number. Just 40 and 10 is kind of the number we chose with to be extra safe. Um, in the software, we chose safety and liveness over performance. And so many of the figures that we have uh, sound like a robot. chosen as defaults are um, can be configured to hire if you do so, if you do please. Okay, when you break down, you sound like a robot. A robot. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure how to better the internet here. Yeah. So it's mostly yes, from no. time to time you break out and this is when the robot part comes in. At that point, it's just like, you should just yell stop. <laughs> and, then, and then I'll pick up again. <laughs> okay, let's pick up like 10 seconds before. Perfect. Um, yeah, so uh, as I touched on before, um, the max inbound and outbound peers. Then after that, we get into some more configuration of the PDP. Now, this is all stuff that's heavily configurable. Um, the majority of people do not actually configure um, these settings um, because they are set by default to um, good and safe numbers. The main stuff that you kind of have to worry about is the RPC um, address exposing it to the wider web, um, your Prometheus metrics, your peers, your private peers, um, your seeds, and then some of your metrics. And then of course, if you run the C node, then you get into the C node section and a bit of the mempool section. So private peers we did cover. Um, that's the mempool can be configured quite quite a bit. Um, you can also set recheck to false. Um, this will diminish the kind of the load on your server. 
and you can also set broadcast defaults. So if you receive, if you're in seed mode, then of course you don't want to be broadcasting transactions. Um, but if you also set your number of transactions in the mempool, then of course you're doing essentially the same thing. You're just saying, I won't accept anything. Um, then you can increase the size of the mempool, this number of transactions of, uh, in the mempool. The recommended is of course the default, but many people do um, increase it if, and many people actually, and some people actually do decrease it on their validators just to reduce the load on their server. Now, like I touched on before, um, Tendermint was written for low, um, low powered environments. So environments with low memory footprints. And so this isn't the large concern, but kind of it's the cherry on top if you want to run on even a smaller server or run um, one as only a signing node. So now we get into the some fasting. So fasting, there's actually two different versions. Um, we're currently in the middle of, uh, we actually finished the V2 of fasting. And it's a different option for fasting. Um, v0, V0 is default because it's just around the longest. And V1 is a refactor for testability. And V2 is a refactor of V1. Um, and we hope that V2 will become the default and it will provide increased performance. So now the consensus um, configuration uh, options. These aren't, um, I do recommend trying to stay away um, from these. There are validators that do touch these. Um, and one is, um, the main one is if you want to um, move forward when you receive two thirds of the votes, then you would end up touching these settings and setting them to zero because then you don't want to wait for everyone to send their vote. You just want to move forward. Um, the interesting thing, the interesting one um, in this um, in this grouping is create empty blocks. So in many environments, um, and on many blockchains, you kind of see the tendency that they're always creating blocks. Um, even if there's no transactions that are on the Cosmos Hub, when there's no transactions, there's still a block that's created. Um, what I was saying is that the, uh, even on the Cosmos Hub, when there's no transactions created, um, there's still a block created. And in many other blockchains and many other ecosystems, this is also fairly common. But um, for some applications, they actually just want to produce blocks when there's a transaction in the mempool or multiple transactions. And so this is essentially that feature. So um, if you have one transaction on Monday, and then let's say it's a slow, it's a slow week, and so you only have one transaction, you have another transaction coming on Thursday. Well, in those four days, you would have created two blocks, but if you had this set, Set, if you had this set to false, but if you had this set to true, then you'd be creating blocks, um, let's say every eight seconds in between Monday and Friday. So next is the TX index section. Um, I believe, yes, uh, Leo asked about this section uh, previously. So in Tendermint, um, and in uh, the Cosmos SDK, you have this event system in which when a transaction is submitted, you have these events that are um, uh, outputted. So you can query specifically to this event. Um, what an example of this might be if you want to search for transactions that um, are over a certain amount of atoms, that is also sent by this particular address, this would provide you a way to do that. Now, this is on a per node basis. And so some nodes that are exposing their RPC won't always have their indexing set to true, indexing all tags, or they might even just index specific tags. Now, um, there are cases where people will not index at all. This, of course, reduces the, uh, increases the efficiency 
of the server because you're not running a, uh, a process in which you're trying to index um, events. And so um, this is something that you can change. Um, you kind of don't have to worry about. Many nodes that are running as full, full nodes, archival nodes, will be setting this to true, um, true in order to provide a better user experience for the people using their RPC endpoints. And now finally, we get to the Prometheus um, instrumentation, the metric gathering. Um, for Tendermint, like I mentioned before, it exposes a bunch of metrics. Um, they can be found. The metrics that Tendermint exposes can be found here. I just post it in the chat, a link to the docs.tendermint.com um, page that goes to our um, goes to our documentation on metrics. Um, this is kind of an ever-growing list, um, and it provides information into the nodes, and so it can be so you can see what's actually going on. And of course, there's many other there's many other metrics that can be gathered through Prometheus. Okay, uh, that was a mouthful. Um, I hope someone was able to take something away from the list of configurable options. Now, are there any questions um, in regards to the config file in particular? I have a question. There is a sound in the background. Is it like from the servers or something? Um, it's from crickets outside because it's really hot here and so <laughs> the crickets are <laughs> chirping. It's got yeah, crickets and birds. Okay, got it. <laughs> okay, except uh, crickets and birds. Any other questions on the configurations that Marco went through? I know we had some slight issues with the um, um, the sound breaking up, but I hope people got uh, like uh, the most important things out of this. But it, it is somehow you fail to understand something from what he went through, just let me know and we can go back to that again. Perfect. So let's see. Okay, so we went through the configuration and what do you plan to do now? Um, I have to actually remember where we left off. Your IDs has been added. Okay, perfect. Okay, we'll so, through and what you want to do now. Yes. So now, since the private PID has been added, has then, been added. Okay. Um, before, we start, um, before we start the node up again, let's just double check that we have the node added as a persistent peer here. So we're going back to the config.toml. Most of the work you do will be in the config.toml. So this is out, error read, stop your error. Perfect. OK, perfect. Um, this is all correct. So I'm actually going to, I believe Malaya is in the chat here. She's, are you are you here, Malaya? Yeah, he is. Victor is here. Good. I'm actually going to um, play one of his articles that he wrote um, a while ago on using system D for uh, running your servers. And so here is a link to the article. Um, and so this is kind of system D is a tool to help manage um, processes. And so you'll be able to use this to run your guide D instance in the background. Um, for me, uh, to not have to go through 
setting it up right now due to time constraints. I'm actually just going to use NoHub. NoHub is kind of a similar thing. Um, and so we're going to do that. And so what NoHub does is just runs Gaia D start in the background and produces a log file for us to either follow along or see if there's any errors. So we'll be able to And perfect. The node's actually already caught up. So let's see if we got let's see if we got everything right. Cool. I have added all resources in Discord, so um, make sure to follow up there in case you need more information, including the um, how to manage the Atom node with um, systemd, the tutorial that Victor wrote. I have also pasted that there, so make sure to follow those information in case you have questions. Okay, back to you, Marco. Marco, can you hear me? Marco, I think you're muted. Great. So now we're just waiting for the validator. Um, what will become the validator node. Um, we're just waiting for it to sync. And I believe it's caught up. Yes? Okay, perfect. It's caught up. Yes. I think it's important to mention here that you have opened it to catch up. Yeah, I was saying that uh, for the audience, I think it's important to mention that can, I believe you. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. can, you hear me? can you hear me? Yeah. I can. Can you hear me? Can, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, don't worry. I was saying that I think it's important to mention to the audience that uh, I believe you have opened up the syncing a while back and you're just um, uh, catching up now because it, it kind of takes you a while to sync um, on the current setup of the network. Yes. Um, so right now the the node was actually able to catch up quite quickly. Um, and so right now, um, we're able to proceed with the next step of um, first we need to, for the next steps of logging into the original validator of the network. Yes, we're losing you. Because he has funds that we want um, he has money, he has tokens that we want to receive to be able to create. Can you, Can you what, find like a better spot? Because I believe it's something to do with the audio or... So you have to go back again. Can you hear me better? Yeah. Perfect. Um, okay, go back. Uh, 
a few minutes uh, in, to, in which you are discussing the uh, catching up. And then I have some questions that we need to address here. Perfect. Um, yes. So the um, and so the next steps that will we're having a hard time with this. Signing into the original there. Okay, Marco. I'm sending tokens from his account to an account receives the tokens. Then, um, okay, let's. Can you hear me better now? Yeah, let's try. Can you? Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I, I, I was trying this. Uh, can you leave the meeting and come back? Maybe you reset something. Okay, let's see if the leaving and coming back works. Okay, waiting for Marco to just join again. Okay, Marco, you're back on. Okay. Oh, Marco. Oh, no. <laughs> okay, better? let's try. Yeah, let's try. We have no other solution for now. I mean, um, I, I can try and answer the questions before okay. I share the screen. Okay, perfect. So we have here um, some, some, uh, some topics. Um, having two validator servers running and be sure not to double sign. How to do that? Okay. Um, so one, one, there's many different configurations on how to do this. Um, one possible way is to, um, you either run two instances of the KMS, but the KMSs are aware of each other meaning that um, the KMSs, the HSMs will be able to communicate. And so if, if the node, um, if one KMS is receiving a, um, is not receiving a response from the validator, then it will notify the other KMS to sign the transaction and send it to the other validator. Now it is, it gets a bit hairy because of configuration, you have to be very careful with this configuration. 
because you can easily accidentally propose two different blocks when it is your time to propose. Um, there, um, I touched on a couple of times. Uh, there's a couple of projects out there who are actually working on instead of having a full node as a validator, you only have a signing node. So your node is essentially just a, um, let's say, just like a mini server that receives um, votes, receives proposals, and, and commits and just signs them and sends them back. And so you're essentially, you don't, because the validator essentially doesn't have to have the previous state. It only has to have one previous blocks state to participate. Okay, I hope we have answered this question, but I wanna make everyone aware of the fact that we'll be running a second workshop um, only on the how to secure a validator with uh, the KMS because the second questions are regarding uh, the KMS. And one is um, which KMS is good and why? Uh, so, so there are a couple. Um, so the one that uh, I am the most familiar with is the TMKMS, and this is currently supported by uh, maintained by inclusion. Um, and they are a kind of cryptography and rest house. And so they, um, and so they are aware of the problems that HSMs and key management co-author the KMS library and signing transactions. So this is the one that there's also, there's another one that, that is a light signing node. Essentially they do is you, feed, you give it the key and instead of running an entire node, they just participate on the P2P layer and on a simple consensus signing layer. So you're essentially um, in, a, in a mini mempool. And so those are the only things that you're running. And so the efficiency um, or the size of the server that you need to run your validator is actually a lot smaller. Um, an interesting thing that the people at Enigma um, Secret Network did recently um, was they were able to extend this um, light signing node. And so this is a secure enclave. Um, that I believe how it works is you would store your key inside of it. Um, I actually do believe uh, if Ian, I believe Ian's from Secret Network, he's here. Um, no, he must have left. Um, but he was here earlier and he was, uh, and he is on the team um, that, or on the, with the Secret Network and Enigma. Um, it, it's kind of, you have to be careful when choosing an HSM. Um, but not only when you're choosing an HSM or a key management system, but also configuring it because misconfigured HSMs and KMSs um, are quite common. Okay, and the last question is how to use KMSs when using a cloud server and if it is possible to do that or not? Yes, um, it is possible to use that, to do that. Um, the recommended um, or, I mean, there are multiple configurations to do it. So in the case of the KMS, um, the recommended path is to have the KMS server um, either um, sharing the server with the validator or in the same um, server, like server rack in the same uh, region of the validator. Um, this is primarily due to latency and width. Of course, um, the internet isn't as efficient as we would like, as we're seeing right now. Um, so if you have your KMS in a different region of the world than your validator, then you uh, run into the potential of missing blocks due to um, high latency um, of the key site.
Tosh, did we answer your question? Uh, uh, I know we've got, uh, we've been interrupted by the backlog of the, the noise, but hope, hope we did. Okay, thanks. Yes, okay, good. Any last questions before we move on? Um, what else do we have to cover, Merkel, from the tutorial? Um, well, I was going to walk through uh, the actual creation step. So I would need to log to the other server and send tokens from that server to, from that account to a different account and then um, run the uh, create validator transaction. Um, okay. Does that, should, should we um, save that part for the second part um, just because we have uh, 13 minutes left or? Uh, how long does it take to do that? Um, it shouldn't take long, but of course doing stuff live is always error prone. Okay, let's try since we have promised people to spin up the entire validator from scratch. Perfect. Okay. Let me, so right now, before I share my screen, I'm just grabbing the IP of the original validator to sign into. Okay, so you should be seeing my screen now. Yes. So we're gonna exit this server and SSH into this server. Okay. Oh. Okay. Um, so from this server, we also need to, and what I'll be doing is creating a key. And Marco. Okay, here's the address, the pub key, um, the mnemonic, all the information that you shouldn't share on a live um, workshop. But for now, we're gonna be using, we're gonna be doing it. So Gaia CLI. So right now, I'm gonna be going through the steps of sending funds from one server to another. TX sender address. And it's The name of the keys test one. Send from test one to this address that we just created. And we want to send a lot. I'm not going to try and claim like how much I'm typing in. Specify. Michael, you have a typo in your command. It's Gaia clean instead of Gaia CLI. Oh, yes, yes. I'll fix that. Thank you, Solomon.
That's a big stake there. <laughs> okay. So we have TX hash here, and let's query. See if it went through successfully. I transfer recipient. Here are the events, um, like I touched on earlier. These are kind of like the things you can index signatures the message transaction the guest wanted the guest used perfect so we can kind of see So right now I'm querying the account just to see that the money oh, came through. Not the money, but the tokens. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay, this one's gonna be a doozy. I'm gonna actually open up the editor so we can walk through the command. Create.shop. Okay, so this is the command that we'll be using to create a validator. So um, we're creating a staking transaction and the transaction is the amount um, is how much we want to specify, how much we want to stake with ourselves, kind of self-delegation, our pub key, our, um, the moniker that we want to use, the website. This is kind of, if you're running a validator, you want to have a website so you can not necessarily, so you can entice and show users, show people who may delegate to um, your validator, um, what, how secure you are, kind of for them to get to know you. We want to specify the chain ID. So in our case, the chain ID is code with us. And the commission rate. The commission rate is the rate that we will be starting out with. This is shown in a percentage, and so that's why you see it as 0 0.01. Um, and then we want to also specify the max rate. The reason why we have a max rate it's just so um, so when you create a validator you um, have a max amount of commission that you will charge so you can this will notify delegators of how much is the maximum amount you can charge some validators do set this to 100 and so it's just kind of um, 0 to 100 percent commission rate and so the max change rate this is the rate that you specify that you will change your commission so in many cases, um, in, in our case here, it's 5%. So in one period, we can only change, if we want to bump our commission, the max amount we can bump it is 5%. And then the min self-delegation is how much we want to set as the minimum self-delegation for ourselves. The gas is just setting it to auto. 
the gas price and we want to specify because it's from okay so this Oops. What's the oops for? Oh, I just typed something. Or did, or did someone else type oops? <laughs> no, no, you Perfect. Your oops. Okay, where are we at? So right now, we're the transaction that we went over and before that we walked through together is um, the transaction now that I'm creating. And so I want to confirm the transaction before signing. Yes. I want to pass in the password. And now we've submitted a transaction to become a validator. So now let's actually Oops. So let's specify. Auto. So I just need double check. Right now I'm just double checking on the my notes that I have everything. Correct. Dun, 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 dun. I believe that was the this. Success log. Let's see if we got it. Oh, this is the thing that always gets me specifying the chain ID.
Mm. Again with the out of gas. Integer. Let's see if that is enough. used. Seems like those are inverted. Now I know why. We'll just fat finger. Well, I think that was a bit too much of a fat finger. <laughs> Don't do this live, people. Watch out with a fat finger. <laughs> it's very dangerous. I believe there was a case in the beginning of the yeah. chain of the Cosmos Hub, correct? Exactly, I was referring to that. Someone lost a lot of money on a fat finger issue, so be very careful when doing this live. The gas just seems to be bumping every time I give it more. Okay, let's see. every time. Hmm. I'm not actually sure what's going on with the gas right now. Yeah, I see it. Even though you, you're giving him more than he requests, there's still an error. Tosh says that maybe you should try like 200,000 K on the gas. Let's try it. Two, two, five. Maybe Tobias will be the winner now with 200,000 K. Let's see. Let's cross our fingers. Oh. Here, looks successful. Woohoo! 
<laughs> Great. There we go. It was a 200,000 then. Your bias was a win. Thank you. Perfect. So now we can actually, let's stop sharing this and go share this guy. And let's see what the most recent height was. Haven't actually. There we go here. We're losing you. Can you hear me, Adriana? Yes, I can now. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so um, were you able to see my screen when we queried to see how many validators there were? I was able to see uh, last the logs, um, but I haven't seen what you have pressed after that. Okay. Let's, I'll just share this guy. So if you can see my screen. Yeah. Um, so here, as you can see, um, there's two validators. So we are able to create one validator um, as we did right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Perfect. Does anyone have any questions? Um, the next uh, Code with us will be covering the setting up the KMS. I don't think we have questions so far. So, in this session, um, you are able to 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 see exactly how to set up a validator from scratch. And in the next one, Marco will show you how to attach um, a KMS to, to your validator and how to secure it uh, better. So be prepared for our next session. And if you have any other questions regarding what Marco has done today, now be the best time to, to do that. Because if not, okay, one more. I promise to bring. Um, I, I, I promise to bring better Wi-Fi next time. Yeah, please do. <laughs> okay, we have one from Tobias again. Uh, what does the Mac commission maximum change rate refer to? And in which time interval does maximum change um, changes actually? The maximum change um, rate for a commission uh, refers to the rate at which you're allowed to change commission 
Um, so if you, um, in our example, um, we set it to 5% and our max rate was uh, 30%. And commission at one percent. So if we wanted to change our commission to six percent, that's the max amount we would be able to do so. So we would change it to six percent, and then we would have to wait a period of time before we're able to change it again. This period of um, can differ from network to network that is using the Cosmos test. Can you hear me? Um, we kind of lost Matt. you for the entire explanation of the maximum change rate and the interval. Um, okay, so we have this in writing now. So maximum change rate refers to the rate at which we can change the commission. So for example, if you had if you have set your commission rate uh, to ten uh, percent, and you want to um, go up to twenty percent, and you have a maximum change rate of uh, maximum, let's say five percent, that means that you can uh, reach your twenty percent in two days because you have a maximum change rate of five percent per day. That means you have to go from ten to fifteen and then from 15 to 20 to be able to reach your um, commission. Um, maximum change interval, I think it refers to like uh, the interval that you will need to set up in order to, um, uh, how often you can actually make the change. Correct, correct Marco? Yes, um, and, in, and this will vary from network to network. Okay, cool. I guess we got it covered. Uh, all the questions. We are so sorry for um, not being able to offer a better connection this time, but we'll make sure to uh, get Marco in the best uh, internet location possible next next time for this uh, for the next workshop to not have this um, prob problems again. Um, I'll be passing a recording on YouTube and also on the Covidas um, webpage under the Cosmos Network if you want to replay this again. And Marco, if you have any more thoughts or information for the people who attended today, you can uh, drop them off in the Discord channel, uh, the Covidas. I have also passed all the information that were linked here. And I want to make sure that everyone knows that our next workshop uh, is on the 21st of July. Um, we'll have people from Chainsafe presenting the workshop and they will walk you through on how to build on Etherbeam, which is currently actively uh, developed by them uh, through a grant by Interchain. So uh, see you all next time. And if you have questions, don't hesitate to um, add them in the Discord channel and we'll be happy to help you with everything you need. And thank you, Marco, for having the time to, uh, to host this workshop. And we'll be looking forward for the next one. Thank you for having me. And sorry for all the Wi-Fi trouble. <laughs> Don't worry. It happens. OK. Thank you, everyone, for joining. And see you all next time. Bye. Ciao, ciao.